Behind the Lines, the greatest war letters ever written and the stories behind them. Hosted by the Emmy Award-winning journalist Barbara Harrison with co-host Andrew Carroll, the New York Times best-selling author and military historian. Fort Benning, Georgia, November 23rd, 1944. Dear Ma, for the nth time, please don't send any more underwear, and the milk of magnesia was absolutely unnecessary. I'm having no more bowel trouble and don't anticipate any. By the way, this week they're teaching us to kill. We lunge about and growl and grimace and look at each other with hate. We're learning jujitsu holds, and to put it bluntly, plain, dirty fighting. This will be invaluable if anyone tries to pick on me again. Mom, don't send any more food, just letters. So long, Mort. Hello, everyone. And welcome to the Behind the Lines podcast, which features readings of some of the greatest war letters ever written, and the stories behind them, as told by the man who found the letters, Andrew Carroll. Andy is the director of the Center for American War Letters at Chapman University in California, and he's made it his life's mission to seek out and preserve correspondences from every U.S. conflict, including the letter you just heard from a soldier, Mart Elovich, to his mom back in 1944. Andy Carroll has published the New York Times bestsellers, War Letters and Behind the Lines, and he's also the author of the play, If All the Sky Were Paper. Welcome, Andy. Hello, Barbara. It's great to be here with you. So, to our listeners, this is our inaugural podcast, and you're going to hear not just Andy reading some of his favorite letters, but Kurt Vonnegut, actors Oliver Platt, Judith Smiley, Martha Plumpton, Juliana Margulies, Frederick Weller and other celebrities who were recorded by Simon & Schuster and Blackstone Audio for the audio versions of Andy's books. But first, Andy, talk a little bit about how this national project to save America's war letters got started. So (laughs) one of the ironies of this whole effort is that I had no interest in history whatsoever growing up. In fact, I think it's pretty fair to say that I hated it. It was just like memorizing events and dates and places. And during my sophomore year in college, I was up in New York. Our family's home in Washington, D.C. burned to the ground. Burned to the ground. It was devastating, just awful. But after the fire, I was speaking with a distant cousin of mine named Carol Jordan. And he had heard through the family grapevine what had happened and asked how we were doing. And I said, well, Carol, you know, fortunately nobody was hurt, which is the most important thing. But everything we have is gone including all of our personal memorabilia, like, you know, the old photos and, of course, letters, which just can't be replaced. And Carol told me that while recently going through his old memorabilia from World War II, he'd come across a letter he'd sent to his wife when he was 23 years old about walking through Buchenwald. We're talking about the Nazi concentration camp? Exactly. And Carol sent me the letter, and the moment I started reading it, I was just immediately drawn in. And here's a part of what he wrote. April 21st, 1945. Dear Betty Ann, I saw something today that makes me realize why we're over here fighting this war. We visited a German political internment camp that had been liberated only two days earlier. The inmates consisted mostly of Jews, some Russians and Poles, and there were six American pilots they had shot and killed almost immediately. First, we saw a German monument that stated 51,600 had died in this camp in three years. The Germans were proud of it. After that, we went up to the place where they torture people. Here were beating devices that I won't explain. In one room, there were eight cremator furnaces. There's another place I won't tell you about because I don't think you'd believe it. Our time was up, so we boarded a truck and rode home, just thinking. All my love, darling, Carol. I will never forget holding that thin, 
onion skin paper in oh, my hands. I can imagine. Yeah, and just and, and thinking how delicate and fragile it seemed and what a stark contrast this was to the weight and significance of his words. Mm. And so when I told Carol that I'd return the letter, he said, keep it. I probably would have ended up throwing it out anyway. So that was the spark? That's what led you to seek out and preserve all those war letters? That, that was definitely part of it. Um, somewhat serendipitously, I was telling a dear friend of mine, Ann Tramer Brownlee, about my cousin's letter. And it turned out that Ann had had an experience almost like mine involving a war letter by her grandfather, Erwin Blonder. What was her experience? So Ann didn't know about her grandfather's war letter until he read it aloud at his 50th wedding anniversary. And it just it, it, it showed her a side of him that she'd never seen before. You know, this is what makes these war letters so special. They're such an intimate and revealing picture of the person writing them. They really are. And in Irwin's case, his letter was so moving because he was writing to his father and brother back in Ohio. And he was telling them not to inform his new wife, Shirley or his mom, that he had volunteered for one of the most dangerous positions in combat. Let's listen to an excerpt from that. September 30th, 1944. Dear Dad and Jerry, I am writing this letter to you to get certain things off my mind. I am telling this to you because I want to spare Shirley the horrible details of war, and I don't want this letter shown to either her or mother. Another reason I am writing this to you is that I want all these thoughts of mine recorded so in later years I can read them and use them in getting a better understanding of life instilled in my children. I am a forward observer for the battalion. I have seen and experienced things that I never dreamed of and will never forget. I have never seen men get hit standing near me, but I saw an artillery shell chew up one of my men. At least he never knew what hit him. My only thought is to get home safely to my wife so she and I can live our lives the way we have always dreamed. I hope that when peace descends upon the world again, we will prove capable of having peace. I don't want my children to endure the things I have. The news sounds optimistic, but here in a foxhole with shells bursting around, you have to be a braver man than I am to be an optimist. There seems to be no end. Please don't show this letter to Shirley or Mom but save it for me for after the war. Give my regards to everyone. Irwin. That was so moving and really puts you right there with him. Another characteristic of these war letters is they are written in the moment. Mm -hmm. You really feel like you're there. You get what they're experiencing. Uh, Absolutely. And, you know, that sentence about wanting to get his thoughts recorded, I I think is especially profound because here he is, he's only 23 years old, And he's already thinking about wanting his letter to educate future generations about the sacrifices of war. Um, What was also very important is I eventually got to meet Irwin, and he became a kind of mentor to me as I started to ask other veterans about their war letters. So you got to meet him. How did he influence you and and your project? He, He really encouraged me to look for stories that weren't being told, stories that deserve more attention. Can you give me an example of that? Definitely the first that comes to mind relates to the Navajo Code Talkers and finding letters that they had written during World War II. Oh, yeah, the Navajo Code Talkers. For listeners who might not be familiar with their story, can you tell us who they were? Yeah, so just briefly, during the war, uh, our military used the Navajo language in the Pacific Theater, and it was really a genius idea because unlike most codes, it wasn't based on mathematics. So they would use like the Navajo word for potato to mean grenade or a transport plane was eagle. And in in some cases, you know, there is no Navajo word for, say, like submarine. So they would invent something that was the word for iron and fish and just put it together. So anyway, Erwin, you know, told me all this long before the Wind Talkers movie came out. And their story really hadn't been told then. And it was through Erwin's encouragement that I found the wife of a Navajo co-talker, Rose Price. Yes, yeah, so sadly, her husband Wilson had passed away, but Rose still had all of his letters. Well, but I'm guessing, though, that he couldn't really write about what he was doing. So, no, not in any detail. In fact, none of the code talkers were allowed to tell anyone what they had done until their story was declassified, like, decades after World War II. So, Andy, what could or, or did he say in his letters? Being a code talker was extremely dangerous. And in one letter, he told Rose, who was his fiance at the time, essentially just to leave him. Ah, can you share that letter? Definitely. He wrote, I know it is pretty hard to say this. 
why don't you just forget me and find someone else? That way you'll be happy and have nothing to worry about. Even though you promised me you will wait till I returned, you might never see me again, the way this war has been going. Goodbye and so long. Love, Price. Uh, so then what happened? Well, Rose did wait for him, and after he returned to the States, they got married and had four beautiful children. Oh, that's wonderful. So when did the War Letters Project really take off? Well, uh, thanks to Erwin Blonder and through word of mouth from speaking with neighbors or family friends who are veterans, I started collecting dozens and then hundreds of war letters. Eventually, I asked Dear Abby to do do a column on the project to encourage her readers to share their war letters with me to archive them for posterity. And she agreed to write about it and help spread the word. What a great idea. That must have reached millions of readers. And this is back at a time when people still read newspapers, although Abby is still very popular. But just as you said, I mean, it's like the floodgates opened. Thousands upon thousands of war letters started pouring in. And now, 20 years later, we have more than 150,000 letters and emails from every conflict in U.S. history. And they're, they're still coming in. And of those you've read, do you have some favorites? Oh, quite a few. Um, when we were preparing for the World War I centennial, we were reading through all of our letters from that conflict, and we uncovered a letter written by this young American officer, Lieutenant Walter Bodeway, who was recovering in a hospital. And he was telling his wife about this new friend. And he wrote that this other soldier had come in with, and I quote, 247 wounds from the shrapnel and machine gun fire. Wow, and still alive. Still alive, and the doctors carved in total more than two pounds of metal out of his body, mostly from his legs. And I mean, that alone is remarkable, but it's all the more meaningful when we learn the name of this new friend, Ernest Hemingway. The Ernest Hemingway. The Ernest Hemingway. And it's it's interesting how he's mentioned just like as a casual aside. I mean, Hemingway wasn't known then. So except for his own letters home, this is probably the first mention of Ernest Hemingway in connection to World War One. And you've come across letters written by quite a few prominent individuals, names we recognize, right? Yes, I've read uh, many letters by soldiers who later went on to become famous. Uh, for instance, I found uh, a previously unpublished letter by a young Kurt Vonnegut, the author, uh, that he wrote at the end of World War II. Vonnegut had been captured during the Battle of the Bulge and then shipped to Dresden, Germany as a prisoner of war. And he survived the firebombing of the city. And this, of course, all became the basis of his book, Slaughterhouse-Five. May 29th, 1945. Dear people, I've been a prisoner of war since December 19th, 1944, when our division was cut to ribbons by Hitler's last desperate thrust through Luxembourg and Belgium. Well, the supermen marched us, without food, water, or sleep, to Limburg, a distance of about 60 miles, I think. 150 such minor beings were shipped to a Dresden work camp on January 10th. I was their leader by virtue of the little German I spoke. It was our misfortune to have sadistic and fanatical guards. After desperately trying to improve our situation for two months and having been met with bland smiles, I told the guards just what I was going to do to them when the Russians came. They beat me up a little. I was fired as group leader. On about February 14th, the Americans came over, followed by the RAF. Their combined labors killed 250,000 people in 24 hours and destroyed all of Dresden, possibly the world's most beautiful city, but not me. After that, we were put to work carrying corpses from air raid shelters. Civilians cursed us and threw rocks as we carried bodies to huge funeral pyres in the city. When General Patton took Leipzig, we were evacuated on foot to Hellendorf on the Saxony-Czechoslovakian border. On that happy day, the Russians were intent on mopping up isolated outlaw resistance in our sector. Their planes, P-39s, strafed and bombed us killing 14, but not me. I'm writing from a Red Cross club. I can't receive mail here, so don't write. Love, Kurt Jr. Oh, wow. 
That was actually Kurt Vonnegut reading. Amazing. Did you meet him? I, I did, and there's an interesting uh, behind-the-scenes story to all of this as well. I had a chance to talk with Vonnegut about his war experiences, and I asked him if he had any other letters from this time. He told me that when they filmed the movie based on his book, Slaughterhouse-Five, he gave the director most of his wartime correspondences along with some uh, sketches and photos, and he told me that he never got them back. They had just disappeared. So conceivably, more wartime letters and memorabilia of Kurt Vonnegut are stashed away in some garage or basement in Hollywood. So anybody living out there in that area right now ought to start looking. Keep an eye out, right? Just hearing that letter, though, you get a sense that Vonnegut, who would have been, I think, about 22 when that was written, was already a budding writer. Even then, there was a literary quality to his writing. And that's the case with so many of these letter writers. They really are almost poets. Another favorite of mine is by the Civil War nurse, Clara Barton. Clara Barton. And just to give our listeners some background, Barton was in her 40s, working as a clerk for the government in Washington, and never had had any formal training as a nurse when she volunteered to help treat wounded troops throughout the war. And of course, we know she went on to establish the American Red Cross. Exactly. I mean, this is a woman who risked her life during the conflict, going onto the field in the middle of a battle to tend to wounded troops. In fact, at Antietam, a bullet came so close to killing her that it tore through her blouse. And on December 12, 1862, on the eve of a clash between Union and Confederate troops, she wrote this beautiful letter to her cousin. December 12, 1862, 2 a.m. My dear cousin Vera, it is the night before a battle. The enemy, Fredericksburg, and its mighty entrenchments lie before us. The river between at tomorrow's dawn our troops will essay to cross and the guns of the enemy will sweep those frail bridges at every breath. The moon is shining through the soft haze with brightness almost prophetic. For the last half hour, I have stood alone in the awful stillness of its glimmering light, gazing upon the strange, sad scene around me, striving to say, Thy will, O God, be done. The acres of little sheltered tents are dark and still as death. No wonder, for as I gazed sorrowfully upon them, I thought I could almost hear the slow flap of the grim messenger's wings as one by one he sought and selected his victims for the morning sacrifice. Already the roll of the moving artillery is sounding in my ears. The battle draws near, and I must catch one hour's sleep for tomorrow's labor. Good night, dear cousin. And heaven grant you strength for your more peaceful and less terrible, but not weary days than mine. Yours in love, Clara. Ah, so beautiful, so eloquent, at such a frightening time. I guess that's the definition of grace under fire. It really is. Andy, you've collected almost 150,000 war letters from every conflict the U.S. has been involved in. That's right, yep. Letters from mostly ordinary Americans doing the extraordinary work of protecting our country. There's so many ways that we can honor and remember our troops and their families. Why is your focus on seeking out and preserving these letters? That's such a good question. I mean, I think there are a number of reasons. Certainly there's a historical component, as so many of these letters and now emails capture history by those who've witnessed world-changing events. But I also think most of all, that these correspondences help us humanize those who serve, as well as their loved ones. They remind us that these are real people making enormous sacrifices. Exactly. They're not just soldiers, sailors, Marines, and airmen. Every single one of them is somebody's child, and in many cases, a parent themselves. And one of the most powerful letters I've ever read touches on this, and it was by an African-American officer named Oscar Mitchell, who was fighting in World War II. And he wrote this letter to a friend who had expressed envy that Mitchell was off experiencing history firsthand. Let's hear that letter. You say that you wish you were over here. Although most people think that they are war conscious, are they really? So far removed from the far-flung battlefronts, how can they be? You are really war conscious when you see the airplanes in formation early in the morning flying to meet their rendezvous and then see this same formation returning in the evenings. But the number is not the same. Twelve went out, 
but only nine returned. You stand there, looking up, watching them fly into the distance, into and part of the horizon, then disappear. You wonder, what really did happen? Those who went down in flames, did they die as you see them in the movies? I don't think so. Not with a smile on their lips and a happy gleam in their eyes, but rather painfully and with the knowledge that this is it. You'd have to see the wounded streaming back from the front after a battle. Above all, to see the light go out of men's eyes. Strong men they are, or were, who did not or will not have the chance ever to live normal lives. People may think they know what war is like. Their knowledge is facts of the mind. Mine is the war-torn body, scared to soul's depth. When I was in the States, war was far away, unreal. I had read, I had seen pictures, but now I know. Oscar. Wow, that was really powerful. And having read through so many letters, Andy, what do you think would surprise people the most? This is what surprised me, is just how much humor there is in some of these letters. You don't usually think of war and humor at the same time. No, absolutely not. But, you know, what, what I discovered is that the troops use levity, often for their own sake, to help uh, counterbalance, I guess you could say, all of the more serious and grim aspects of war. And one of my favorites is by a 23-year-old U.S. Marine second lieutenant named Barbara Demetria. And she was in Iraq and wrote home about how she got her call sign, Heine. I think I want to hear that. Hi, everyone. I was sitting on crew today and realized I hadn't shared the tale of my call sign with you. It is one of danger and embarrassment. I think it was our third location where Liza and I had to share a tent. Turns out, we were located right in the middle of a dried-out riverbed. Great place to be when it rains. So we all trudge over to the direct air support center in ankle-deep mud in the middle of the night with hardly any illumination from the moon. The combat operations center tent was a big round tent we called the Thunderdome. There is a little passageway that connects our tent to the Thunderdome, and it was particularly slippery with all the mud that had been tracked in by traffic, and I had come close to slipping several times. General Mattis, as in the commanding general of the entire 1st Marine Division, was using the phone at this table. I need to give the air officer in the Combat Operations Center some information, so I start heading through the passageway and I felt myself slip. At this point, one of those slow motion moments began, and I thought, no! I could feel myself falling and I knew I couldn't stop. The general's back was to me, and I couldn't stop myself. I went head first into his butt. Yes, my head, his butt. Thus marked the birth of Heine. Luckily, the man was talking on the phone and was kind enough not to berate me. Every time I see him and say good morning, he smiles, thinking, yep, that's the girl. I gotta go for now, but I thought you would enjoy that one. I'll write more as soon as I get a chance. I love you guys. Heine. Heine. Sounds like it's stuck. I, I think it did, yeah. <laughs> and, but interestingly enough, we have a letter on a somewhat similar topic, and it's from the Civil War. It was written by a Confederate soldier named Andrew Stone, who was clearly ticked off how the conflict ended and wrote the following to a friend. June 12, 1865. Well, George, I would like to hear from you, but I ain't got time to stay now. I'm just on my way to regions unknown. Tell my folks that everything is lovely and the goose hangs high. I shan't come home till my place is sold. Well, for some of my foolery now, you tell them abolition friends of mine that when I die that I want to be buried with my face down so they can kiss my ass without turning me over. Well, I will have to bid you goodbye for this time. I would like to see my folks it is impossible now to come home. Now tell them not to fret about me. I should take care of my own hide now, and when I get through with that, then I can take care of them. So goodbye for this time. Andrew Osborne Stone. 
<laughs> well, he certainly didn't mince words, did he, Andy? No, he didn't. And and really, I've been amazed by how many body letters I've come across from earlier conflicts like the Revolution and the Civil War. You just don't hear them in documentaries or see them in the history books. And there are also correspondences that are funny, but unintentionally so. Mm-hmm. Two of my favorites are letters, or they're really memos, written during World War II by U.S. government scientists who had this absolutely crazy idea to weaponize bats that they would then release over Japan. Weaponize bats? Yeah, and, and what I love is that <laughs> we got the original Batman, Adam West, to read the first memo. July 10th, 1942. Office of the Coordinator of Research and Development Navy Department, Washington, D.C. Dear Sir, When last in Washington, the writer called at your office and presented an idea which has been brought to NDRC for its consideration and action. This idea, as will be evidenced by the attached correspondence, was first presented to the President of the United States last January. Briefly stated, The concept is to use the common American bat as a carrier for small incendiaries. The original proposal was to release these bats, for example, some hundreds of miles off the shores of Japan, and at such a time as would permit the bat to travel to land, arriving shortly before daylight. The habit of the bat is such that with light it would seek a refuge by crawling into crevices under roofs, thatching, and generally into small places where conceivably fires could be very easily started by means of a bat-borne incendiary weighing approximately one ounce. In such a use, the bats would have to be shipped at temperatures below 50 degrees Fahrenheit, where they hibernate and can be, I am told, packed in cases like any other inanimate objects. So real live bats were to be packed and shipped in planes with little bombs tied to them and then dropped over Japan? That that, that was the main idea. And the memo goes on to outline all this in further detail. And then we have the report written by another scientist as to how the experiments went and not well, I should say. Let's hear that. July 2nd, 1943. These tests had shown that the bats were not as easy to catch as had been supposed that they were more delicate than had been supposed, that they were much more difficult to cause to hibernate than had been supposed, and that once in hibernation, they were not as easily aroused as had been supposed. Furthermore, release of the bats from aircraft was an item which would require considerable experimentation. Some bats, if sluggish, plummeted to the ground. Others, if put out of a plane at high speed, apparently had their wings broken. Lastly, the bats were not able to carry the load expected, 18 grams, but would carry successfully a load of 11 grams. In the latter stages of the experiment, there was a disaster in which the hangars and outlying buildings of the small airport used burned down. The cause of the fire was never ascertained, but it served to discourage the group. Needless to say, the BAT plan was never actually implemented. Andy, getting back to the personal letters, share with us how has letter writing in wartime changed over the years? You know, whether it's the Revolutionary War or Iraq, the content really hasn't changed, but the way the letters are written has. So one of the most fascinating developments in wartime communication came during Vietnam. And instead of writing letters, loved ones exchanged audio letters, which were, so these were messages recorded on audio reels and sent back and forth between Vietnam and the States. And we were fortunate to receive a series of these letters from none other than the Patton family. As in the famous General George S. Patton? So not from him, but yes, his family. So General Patton's grandson, Ben, had all these audio letters recorded by his father, also George S. Patton, who fought in both Korea and Vietnam. So when he was in Vietnam, Colonel Patton sent his wife recordings that she would listen to and then record and mail back her reply. Now, obviously, they both had tape machines that made this possible. So, Andy, did you find any difference in content between the audio letters and regular written letters? Well, as I said before, the content really wasn't that different. Um, Colonel Patton articulated all the sorts of things that troops express in regular letters on paper. But what makes the audio letter so unique is you can sometimes hear the artillery and gunfire in the background as he's speaking, and you can also hear the tone of his voice. So let's listen to one of those audio letters from Colonel George Patton. Testing one, two, one, two, one, two, one, two, out. 
So here we are. We moved up to Lie K this morning. It's uh, it's uh, 10 30 in the evening on the 17th. I've been here two days. Spent the most of the day uh, looking around the area. Trying to, uh, there's some, trying to uh, figure out what goes on around here. And it's hard. To give you an example, yesterday in F Troop 2nd Squadron, how about that one? Wait, let's see how that played back. Had another first, and I just want to read you this first. Mr. and Mrs. Edward F. Will, 16764, Sarsalito, Whittier, California. Dear Mr. and Mrs. Will, on behalf of the officers and men of the 11th Armored Cavalry Regiment, I extend my deepest sympathy for the loss of your son on 9 July 68. We of the Black Horse mourn the death of a comrade in arms who paid the ultimate price in the defense of his country and our way of life. His name will be added to the regimental memorial for those men of the Black Horse who have died in Vietnam. G.S. Patton, Colonel Armour Commanding. Now I have to, I got about three more like that to sign in my box, but I just can't get around to it tonight. They're pretty bleak, pretty bleak. Uh, also today, uh, we lost two tanks from mines, and uh, two infantrymen were blown off one of the tanks. Two infantrymen out of the 16th Infantry, the 1st Infantry Division, commanded by a man named McLean, Lieutenant Colonel, and uh, luckily neither of those were seriously hurt. One, one had a, a sprained ankle and one had a broken wrist. So they're gonna be all right. Well, I just wanted you to know we're, we're in it, kiddo. We're in it, baby doll. Good night. I just want to emphasize again how indebted we are to the Patton family and especially Ben for sharing these with us. No one outside of the family has heard most of these tapes before. And regarding the more current wars, what about emails? I think you said you look for those as well. Oh, absolutely. And and this might be a perfect one to end our episode on because it's not only a war-related email, and we definitely want to make sure these are preserved, but this is also what we call a home front correspondence. These are the letters from a service member's uh, spouse or parent, child, friend, or any other loved ones. And we truly believe that they too serve and sacrifice in times of war. Now, just to give the context of this following email, it was written by a woman named Myrna Bine. Near the beginning of the Iraq War in 2004, Myrna's son Charles was caught in an ambush and he lost the lower part of his leg. Charles was very athletic and active, so this was a really debilitating loss. He came back to recuperate at Walter Reed, and Myrna visited him regularly. She was also updating people via email about his condition. And this is just one correspondence she wrote that I think is, is so eloquent, so poetic. A sock did me in a few nights ago. A plain white sock. I had brought Charles' soiled clothes home from Walter Reed to wash, Everything had gone through the wash and dry cycles, and I had dumped the freshly laundered clothes onto the bed to fold them. It was late and I was quite weary, so I wanted to finish and get to bed to try for a better night's sleep than I've been having lately. I found one sock, just one. I folded all the rest of the clothes and still, just one sock. Without even thinking, I walked back to the laundry room and searched the dryer for the mate. Nothing was there. I looked between the washer and dryer and all around the floor in case I dropped the other socks somewhere during the loading and unloading processes. Still, my tired and preoccupied brain didn't get it. As I walked back to the bedroom with the one sock in hand, it hit me like a punch to the gut. There was no other sock. There was also no other foot or lower leg or knee. I stood there in my bedroom and clutched that one clean sock to my breast and an involuntary moan came from my throat. But it originated in my heart. So moving. As a mother myself, that one really touches my heart. It, it touches me too. Our time is just about up. And I want to thank Blackstone Audio for letting us include recordings of emails featured in the audio version of Andy Carroll's book, Operation Homecoming. And we also want to thank Simon & Schuster Audio for letting us use letters from the audiobooks, War Letters, and Behind the Lines, available wherever audiobooks are sold. 
please visit simonandschuster.com for more information. This is just the first of what will be an ongoing series of Behind the Lines podcasts. You can find more information on the website, warletters.us, not only about the show, but about Andy's Center for American War Letters at Chapman University and their efforts to save these irreplaceable correspondences. And I just want to add that someone out there listening might even have a war letter or letters from their family to share that will end up on a future episode. Right. And people can also help us just by spreading the word. Again, all the information is on warletters.us. And be sure to tune in for our next episode, which will feature letters about the Spanish flu pandemic during World War I, as well as correspondence related to the COVID-19 pandemic today. I'm Barbara Harrison, and thanks again for listening to the Behind the Lines podcast.